Nate, I will explain a few things. Mel not Melanie, but Stephanie will find the PowerPoint. Should be open somewhere. That's the one there. You make this slide big. Yes, this one. Beautiful. Thank you so much, dear you. I will be using that liquor in a moment of time. DIBC, Duncan Independent Bible Church. Do this in remembrance of the Nazarene. Mm. I'm excited about tonight's message, of course. Okay, You know already the commitment that we have at Duncan Bi uh, Independent Bible Church concerning communion. We do it only three times a year, and every time that we do it, we make a big show, all of it. Sorry for the expression, but the emphasis is on Christ's uh, accomplishment because what we partake, you know that already, it is an abridged Passover. So when you go to the Passover with the Jews, they basically at Passover recite the old account of the Exodus, and that's why they have a good memory because they memorize the scriptures and that's why we don't do it too often here, so that we may always keep it Christ-centered. Do you know what? This is our third time, okay? In a year and few months of existence, this is the third time. And the last time that I, basically, we did commune together, goes back on July the 9th. And I don't know if you remember, probably not. It doesn't matter because it's long past. I gave you the 10 purposes for the Incarnation. Because Christ became incarnate, meekness and majesty and so on. And I gave you the 10 purposes for the incarnation here as to why God became incarnate. And you had a half pager and I said, this is what you need to remember for today. The content, it was a great content. So it's going to be the same today. The content to remember will be quite something again. And I have years of preaching on that because doing the communion like this uh, three times a year, it's kind of easy to, cry, to be Christ-centered. It's going to take a lifetime of people, of preachers, that will take a walk in my shoes after that to do it. Let's go back to the title, The IBC Do This in Remembrance of the Nazarene. I would like to reread what I read for you and make an examination of these things. Now, turn in Matthew again, if you are still there. I want to read Matthew again. Okay, I want to read Matthew chapter 2 one more time and make a few comments, additional comments. By the way, I have a question for you. Do you know what is a Nazarene? Mm. He lives, somebody says he lives in Nazareth. Fine, good. We'll discover a little bit more. This is exact. There is a little more behind it. Okay? So now I got your curiosity, eh, Linda? You're like this, and we're looking forward to see what's going on. Beautiful. Come with me in chapter 2 of Matthew, verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. That was Herod the Great. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother Mary, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over in Judea in place of his father Herod, was afraid to go there. Then a divine intervention. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came He lived in a city called Nazareth. And this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, plural, that he shall be called a Nazarene. Luke 2.39 is on this, the, 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 the PowerPoint. I put some on the PowerPoint, some won't show. When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, which is in the north, to their own city of Nazareth. I want to explain verse 23 of Matthew very carefully when it says, and he came and lived in a city called Nazareth, and this was to fulfill what, what was spoken through the prophets, and he shall be called a Nazarene. Okay? Do you know what a concordance is? A big book, now it's on computer, but it's about that thick, it's bigger than a phone book. I challenge you to take a concordance and to find at least one, you need two, places 
in the Old Testament to find a prophets, and you need two, because the word prophets is in the plural, I need two references where it says into the Old Testament that Jesus shall be called a Nazarene. I wait for you. I'm going to wait a long time because you will find no such a thing ever. It's non-existent. Nowhere in the Old Testament it says that Christ shall be called a Nazarene. Okay? What it is here, it says prophets, it's a summation. It's a summary at large of what all the prophets says about the Messiah. And what we need to know, we need to know the connotation of the Nazarene in the first century here. A Nazarene or the Nazarene were despised people. It's a term used for reproach and shame. We see the attitude reflected in this passage right here. They were looked down. Remember in Canada, the old days, about 30 years ago, the Newfie jokes? Or in Victoria here, the Langford, looking down on Langford people? Same connotation. So a Nazarene means a despised and a rejected individual, and this is reflected right there. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel, Nathaniel said to him, can any good thing come out of Quebec, uh, Nazareth? <laughs> That's reflected right there because they were looked upon, upon as being rejected and despised and rejected individual. The Nazarene was basically despised, I repeat, and rejected individual, just like the time, like I said, when we used to do, not kind all the time, the newfie, the newfie jokes and so on. Now the question will become, what did the prophets say about the Messiah? They, indeed, as we will see tonight, predicted that he would be, in humanity, a despised and rejected individual. So, the usage of the term Nazarene is a very convenient way of summarizing the teaching of the prophets that Yeshua, Jesus if you prefer, would be despised and rejected. That is clearly prophesied. So, it's a summation. It's a summary of story about Jesus that you find scattered in different prophets here. That he would say that he would be a despised and rejected individual, and that's why these things are necessary to remember when we come in the breaking of the bread and so on. I want to walk you through right now to some scriptures. Come with me in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I'll go there for you, although it's there. I don't need it right now in my Bible. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, is what we call the Proto-Evangelium. This is the first gospel. It contains the first gospel right there and the deal with sin, the deal, the, the, the necessity to deal with sin. Okay, let's look at this carefully. I will put enmity between you, is talking to the serpent right now, and the woman, womanhood. And between your seed, which is the satanic seed, the Antichrist, and her seed, the Messiah. He shall bruise you on the head. He's talking to the serpent. He says to the serpent, He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him, the, the, the seed of the woman, on the heel. That's the Old Testament way or the Palestinian way of killing a serpent. The way you kill a serpent, you don't hit the tail. So basically, pictures this here. While the, the Messiah will crush the head of the serpent like this. But while the foot go down here of the Messiah to crush the seed of the serpent, the serpent will stand up erect and he will bite the heel, the heel of Jesus. The blow of the Messiah to Satan to the head will prove deadly. That's why Satan will spend the rest of eternity in the abyss and then the lake of fire. The bruising of the head, it's painful, but not deadly. 
not deadly to, etern to eternity. So the crushing of the head of a snake is fatal. The bruising of the heel is painful, but not terminal. That's the first gospel, that he will be despised by Satan. I don't need to do a course on that. That he will dis be despised by Satan, but he will win the victory in the course of time. That's why Satan sustained a hatred against womanhood in particular. So men in the congregation, we need to be protective of our wives. It's very important to give them the protection that they need. Come with me in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 50. We look at some passage. Isaiah chapter 50. Come with me in Isaiah chapter 50, another prophet, that was the law. By the way, the prophet who wrote this is Moses. I don't have a slide for this one. Isaiah 50 verses 4, 5, and 6. Isaiah 50, chapter, uh, verses, uh, chapter 50 of Isaiah, verses 4, 5, and 6. Boy was talking about things. I can't remember what he said about having the hard time to wrap your mind about something. I can't remember your example, brother. It's not relevant for now to remember this. But I said that you said something about having problem with the passage to understand and stuff like that. And it takes a lifetime. This one is for me the same. Same example as you brought last week, brother. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4 talks about the servant of Jehovah, the Messiah. Listen to this. The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples. Beloved, Jesus Christ, the tongue of disciple. The second person of the Trinity became a disciple, a learner. Figure this one out. Lord God has given me the tongue of a disciple that I know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. He, he awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. A second person of the Trinity is, is Christ Jesus, and he is the Jehovah also of the Old Testament. It's three in one. So morning by morning he was sleeping. He was awakened at 4 to 4.15 in the morning to receive a training in his humanity concerning his mission as a disciple. We do Bible study here and at your church also, and we have 8, 10, 15 people. If he was a disciple in time, how much more should we also be disciples? The Lord has opened my ear. In Hebrew, dug my ear. It's a, it's a, it's a principle of obedience here. I was not disobedient, nor did I turn my back. I gave my back to those who strike me as the scourge. My cheeks to those who plucked the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. For the Lord God helps me. In verse 7, I don't need this here. You became obedient as a bond servant. When you are obedient and you like your servant, what, we were, what they were doing in Exodus chapter 21, they were pursing the, lo the, the lobe of the ear against the doorpost with an awl here. It means that the servant was willing to carry on with his master and he became one with the house. That's the digging of the here. That's what it conveys in Hebrew. Based upon Psalm 40 in Isaiah chapter 5. The Lord God has opened my here. I became a bound servant because God, Christ Jesus, knew all the benefits of being part of the Trinity and what it is to be God also. In verse 6, we have the description of the suffering. I read it. The main point in Isaiah that is not on the screen here, the Nazarene will suffer and be mistreated. So now you start to understand why you shall be called a Nazarene. You need to go in different places. It means that he comes from Nazareth, but much more, Nancy. It means a despised and rejected individual. That's why you don't find only one prophet that says this about him. And this is quite worth to remember as we will partake. Zechariah. Zechariah 11. Look at this. Verse 12 and 13. I said to them, do you know the story of Zechariah? Zechariah was asked to play a scene as a shepherd. It pictures the Messiah. He was asked to play a shepherd 
prophetically as being the Messiah. Okay, that's in the book for those that we did the minor prophets together. I said to them, Zechariah said to the leadership of Israel, if it is good in your sight, give me my wages, because they never agree on a wages to start with. But if not, never mind. So they waited out 30 piece, 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Then the Lord said to me, Jehovah said to me, throw it in the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. Because it's prophetic. Because you know that he was sold, Christ Jesus, for 30 pieces of silver. So Zechariah plays a role of the shepherd with the Judah and Israel and so on. And then they don't agree on the price. And he goes to them, what do you think of my work? Did I do a good job? They said, okay. Then the Lord said to me, throw it into the potter that was that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord here. And it's very sarcastic, that magnificent price at which they have valued me. So glad that we have a cement floor here. Listen to that noise. So much for your work. Why do I expect praise from you? If I'm asked to walk in his path in ministry. Jehovah, they have weighted the salary of Jehovah. 30 pieces of silver. Here is, there is only 10 bucks thrown on the floor. I wanted the coins to be heavy. But I, what I wanted is the noise. There was no carpet in this temple at that time. They weighed 30 pieces of silver, throw it on the floor. This is your wage. Do you know what is the significance of 30 pieces of silver? That's the price of a dead slave. If you have a slave working in your field, I have a slave and your, your ox gore, my slave here, I need to, you need to pay me 30 pieces of silver. That is the price for a dead slave. Beautiful. It was prophesied in Matthew 26, 14 to 11. Zechariah 12, 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for, uh, on, uh, for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the, like the bitter weeping of a firstborn. You have seen painting a lot of, because you, you are mature physically and spiritually also. You have seen artistic Romans and Greek painting of Jesus Christ. And when he is on the cross like this and so on, you always find him with what we call a loin covering improper. The Roman way of killing a, a, a criminal by means of crucifixion, they are crucified in the nude, naked. So the people was walking around seeing the nakedness of the Messiah. If you don't call it a Nazarene despised and rejected individual, that's the epitome of it, basically. Naked of the cross was not enough shame. So what have they done? They threw a spear on his side and they pierced here. It was thrust through as if it was one, not enough. Talk about despised and something to remember as we commune together. Now I come to the most important of the message and I'm asking you for grace. Turn with me here in Isaiah 52 in your Bible, verse 13. You have a half pager. You have a half-pager in your possession. So take your half-pager with me. I want to explain to you a beauty and finish the message. It's going to take about 15 minutes to go through that. Isaiah 52, chapter, uh, chapter 52, verses 13, straight down to 53, 12, has five strophes. That's what we call in music or in singing or in poetry, strophes. They're right there. 
five times you have five strophes and each strophe has three verses attached to it. All right? You have this on your half pager. So the first strophe, you will have the first sentence, Behold, my servant will prosper. The theme will be, he will prosper. The second one, who has believed our message? Verses, chapter 53, verses 1, 2, and 3. The theme will be Israel's unbelief. Number three, surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows. This is the verse 4. He carried uh, 53, chapter 4, 5, and 6, three verses. The theme, the substitutionary sufferings of the Messiah. Number four, Strophe, he was oppressed and he was afflicted in seven, eight, and nine. The theme, the silent suffering and death of the servant. Number five, but Jehovah was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. 10, 11, and 12, the theme, the Messiah's offering for sin. So let's go back and let me read for you and make just a few comments. Are you with me? Do I have your attention? Beautiful. Now you come with me in the first trophy, chapter 52, verse 13, 14, and 15. Come. Behold, my servant will deal wisely. One more word. I'm not going to expound fully. I will expound fully on this in the study of Dicea. Tonight, I will keep it proper to the rejection of the despised individual. For the fact, what is the title of the message tonight? In remembrance of the Nazarene. Thank you so much. Behold, my servant shall deal wisely. It's better prosper. He will be exalted. The word exalted here is the word to rise. So the word exalted here refers to the resurrection of the Messiah. And lifted up refers to the ascension and shall be very high. It refers to his present session. So in one verse, you have the rising from the death, the ascension, and his present session as a high priest. Like as many were astonished at you, his visage was so marred more than any man, and is formed than the son of man. After the scourge, and everything that he was suffering on the cross, he was on the cross merely recognizable. He was still has the form of a man, but he was not recognizable. All pumpy and bloody after the Roman scourge, he was merely recognizable here. That's a very sharp word here. His visage was so more, more than a man in his form than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. It's better to have the word star, uh, startle instead of sprinkle. Sprinkle. Kings shall shut their mouths in the future, like Job. When he was entering a classroom somewhere, the youth were fleeing away, and the elders were putting their hands among, uh, on their mouth by respect here. At, hi, uh, at him, for, for they had not been told them that they see, and that which they had not heard shall they understand. That's the first strophe, not recognizable on the cross. And he said, whenever you come and do this, Francois, remember what I went through to buy you back. Linda, remember me. Remember what I did to buy you back. You will never be asked to be unrecognizable like he did. The second strophe. Okay, 53 verse 1. Who has believed our message here? The Israel, that's Israel's unbelief. And to whom has the arm of Jehovah been revealed? My arm is attached to my body. The arm, it's a motif developed by Isaiah. The arm of Jehovah is the second person of the triune God. It's Jesus. Okay? For he grew up, he grew up, for he grew up before him as a tender plant. Who has a garden? Who has a garden? Do you grow tomatoes? What is a suckling concerning horticulture? Show the show, say that for me. What's a suckling? Suckling is, it grows off to the side. 
it grows off to the side of the main stem. Eh? What do you do with them? You cut them up and you throw them away. So here it's not a tender lamb or a tender suckling. It's not a newborn. It's somebody that will be cut off and thrown away as a nuisance to grow. That's what it is in Isaiah. And as a root out of the parched ground. He has no form nor comeliness. He was not the richer gear of his time. Or the, uh, the what's the famous actor that all the women are in, in, in uh, not Joe Blow, but what that is, what's the, uh, Brad Pitt. He yeah. was not the Brad Pitt of his time. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Beloved, number three, verse three, was despised and rejected of men. Circle the word men. It's men of renown. That's exactly what happened to him with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were supposed to be men of renown, men of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The grief here is sicknesses. Not that he was plagued with them, but he healed the sick. So he was very well acquainted with COVID-19. Even with leprosy, because as far as I know, he touched the leper. Go show yourself to the priests. And as from men hid their, their face. Have you been in Trifty? How do you feel at Walmart um, if you have the mask or not, and you walk in the aisle and you almost see the other person bouncing on the shelf to avoid you. If you're not insulted by that, good for you. I am. I feel like this. You change the sidewalk. That was the personality of Christ. Nothing to attract the visual, no comeliness and so on here. But despised and rejected men of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and one from men hid their face. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. That's what I have to say. Despised and rejected, that's how you find it in the Old Testament. Verse 4, 5, and 6. Look at verse 4. That's the first sentence. Three verses, third strophe. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Okay? Yet we did not, we, we did esteem in stricken. Stricken is shocking disease, if you want to, in, in the Hebrew. Smitten of God and afflicted. I wanted the word afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Notice the pronoun. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. The we, it's Israel, but we partake in it. We have turned everyone from his own way. Israel in the time of Isaiah. And Jehovah has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So that's basically the third strophe. What we have here, substitutionary debt. Okay? They, they violate the law. In verse 8, I will come back to that later. The substitutionary debt is very important for your salvation. Who violated the law? These people around the law back then. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the common people. They violated the law. So he took upon himself the very penalty of having violated the law. And he never did it. So this is a substitutionary debt that he died. It's vicarious. He died instead of you. In our place. For any kind of violation. The law was never given to the Gentiles. So what they were not capable to do. He did it perfectly. Yet he was killed. So that's a beautiful substitution here. Alright. So that's why I give you the pronoun in their context in verse 6. The we Jewish people. We have turned everyone to our own ways. Violating the law. And Jehovah has laid on him the iniquity of us all here. So. It teaches his substitutionary death. He was not supposed to be the one being crucified. It was me that was supposed to be crucified and you. We'll partake in the bread and the wine in a moment. That's why he says, I'm not on my notes right now and I stumble because that Bible is written for small. 1 Corinthians 11, 20, some, 23. When you do this, remember me. A lifetime of pastoral work, 
of Bible Expositor will never be sufficient to find out in details all that he did. Tonight, to be honest with you, I find my message a little bit too packed. I should have been smart this afternoon. I always change it to do only that part of the Messiah. But I said the time is on our side and the time is not on our side also because I wanted to cover a little bit more because we don't partake of the bread and the wine very often. So I find the message a bit packed because there is enough in there to keep you for three messages. That's what we will do in Isaiah. We will do, go a little bit more in depth with these things. That's what's the difference between a Bible study and a sermon or a predication. And you know my tendency. It's to teach. Pastor Boy was quite different in style, which I admire too. Both are needed and so on. Number four, he was oppressed and afflicted. Okay? Number four, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Seven, eight, and nine. He was oppressed, yet when he was afflicted, he opened not his mouth. When I suffer hardship, Sylvie, in my apartment, am I the style that doesn't say a word about it? Thank you so much. And the first guy to whine. Oh, the people in the building don't like our child and so on, and I suffer all kinds of persecution because I live in an apartment building with a child, and it's not a good thing. So he did that for me. As a lamb that is led to the slaughter, as a sheep that before its shearer is dumb. So he opened not his mouth by oppression. Circle the word oppression. It's by prison. Because when he was scourged in the temple, he was in the section when they keep the prisoner. And that's where he was scourged. And judgment he was taking away. His death was judicial. It was an issue of justice to God. And judgment he was taken away for death. As, and as for his generation, who among them considered that he was cut off. Cut off. So where do you find that expression caught off all the time repeatedly? In the book of Exodus, when you don't do the law, that person shall be cut off from among my people. That person shall be cut off. So he died a penal death. It's a law court system because he was accused to violate the law. He took upon his shoulder the, miss, the miss, missing of the mark of everybody. That's basically a penal death here. He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the strike was due. Verse 9 here. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Contradictive if you don't know your Bible. And the assign is graved with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. When you are, do you know the story of Boot Hill? In all generations of the people, the criminal are buried in the criminal's grave type of thing. There, what is the place for Boot Hill where the cowboy were they, they buried there as criminal with their boots on? What's that uh, state in the United States? Who? Uh, thank you so much. In Arizona type of thing. So he was supposed to die since his death was a penal death. He was supposed to be buried in a criminal yard. But with, with the intervention of a, a, name, a fellow called named Joseph Arimathea, he get the body from Pilate, and by a divine intervention, he was buried in a rich man's tomb. So there is no contradiction here. Verse 11, we're not there yet, so we'll come to the next one. Where was I? His grave would aside with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, neither was in, it, in this seat in his mouth. We take the last one. Number five, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. The theme of it is the Messiah's offering for sin. Let me elaborate on this one. Yet it pleased, circle the word please, it means God's will. So it was the Father's will to crush him like this, putting him to grief here, to bruise. He has put him to grief. Same thing, goodwill again, that's the God's will. When you shall make his soul an offering for sin, because he make his soul an offering for sin. Notice something, read with me, stay concentrated. He says here, when you shall make his soul an offering for sin. When you give an offering, the, off the offering dies. 
It was an animal in the Old Testament. Now it's the Messiah's dying here. Look at the next sentence here. It says, when you shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Jehovah will prosper in his hand. How is it possible that he may see his seed? How is it possible he just die? He will see future tense his seed. Seed, do you know what they are? All the spiritual people that are reborn in the spirit. It does include you and I. But how can he see it? Only by means of the? Say it louder. Only by means of the? Resurrection. Satan bit the hill. But it's not fatal unto eternity. Just bruised him. So by means of resurrection, he will see his seed. The seed are the spiritually reborn people. It counts for the Jews and it counts for you and I. He will see you and so on. Okay? He shall see the travail of his soul. And in verse 11, and he shall be satisfied. Theologically, what is satisfied? God the Father had a wrath against sin. And when he looks upon the work of Jesus, he became satisfied, meaning propitiated. He is appeased. So when he sees the work of Christ, it, it, just picture him. It's a lazy boy. He is like this with anger and wrath against sin. He looks at the work of the Son and... Ugh, I'm appeased at peace. So when he look upon Sylvie, he doesn't see Sylvie as Sylvie, cannot look upon this. But he sees Sylvie with his lens and he sees the sun. And all of a sudden, a smile. Ah, ah. He cannot be propitiated by my and your good deeds. Helping the old lady. I always do that for Kit. Helen. Oh, Father, I open the door every Thursday for her. Andreas. And I put the stroller, not the stroller, but the walker in the trunk of the car. So therefore, God, I'm good. How many of you do oil change in the car? You all do that. What's the mechanic have? It's called a rag. And usually it's not that lean. You would not wipe your mouth with this. So the opening of the trunk to put the chair is like filthy rags. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I say, it's hard to swallow that. That's what it is. Because we can do, do nothing commendable that would commend us to him. We need to come to him by means of a substitution, which is the Messiah, the despised, rejected Nazarene, here. That's the only way. Where was I? Satisfied by the knowledge of him, not himself. It should read in Hebrew, by the knowledge of him shall my righteous servant justify many. There is two ways, two words for knowledge. To know, I know that the table is there because that's why I don't uh, uh, go further. But there is a word knowledge in Hebrew that means to know by experience. You have found him, so therefore you know him by experience. How much more should we strive to suffer for him? Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. When will he do it? Messianic kingdom. And he will divide the spoil with you, because he poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bared the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. I'm done with this. I stumble over my words tonight. Eh? Thank you so much. He's the only one that says that's okay. As I conclude, he wants us to remember him. He wants us to remember the Nazarene, the despised and rejected individual. But it's not all that he wants, and I want to turn. I'm not going to turn. Don't turn. It's okay. For you have been called for this purpose. You've been called to suffer. It's positional truth. Do you like it? 
Ah, oh, we like to be uh, forgiven. The 33 position in the Messiah uh, propitiated forgiveness and uh, uh, draw near. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also Nazarene for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. That's quite something when you think about it. Yeah, who took a deep breath, deep breath like this? Who did? I would like you to... We'll keep silent for a moment. I'll explain what we do right now. Let's keep a short silent time just to reflect, not upon the thing that you did not understand, but upon the thing that you understood tonight in light of the message that I brought here. I think there was a bit of fatigue behind it anyway. I don't want to find an excuse. And then Stephanie will play Amazing Grace instrumental, the violin that you have heard already. Uh, and while the music plays about Amazing Grace, we'll lower the volume. I would like you, starting in the back row, just watch your neighbor, starting in the back row, come and get your wine and bread and return to your seat, sit down and wait. We will partake all at the same time. You know the instruction? That's simple. You can 